episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Okay, and we are live. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Derek Adkins, um, cellist and and uh, cello enthusiast, like many of you, I expect. And um, thanks so much, William, and all of you at Cello Bello for hosting another cello chat. You know, where we can all come together and and talk about this thing that we all share and that we all care so much about. Um, William and I were just talking, and and um, normally I know there's a a topic for these things, and so we've just sort of named the topic I'd like to talk about. But I wanted to start by um, drawing on what for me has been a really big and really um, nourishing part of my life as a musician and my career as a cellist, which is bringing new and unfamiliar pieces to life to, um, you know, as sometimes in the form of commissions, but other times just in the form of first performances, um, premieres of all kinds and um, collaborations with composers of, to varying degrees of collaboration where sometimes um, sometimes composers are are very interested in in um, working together with a with a soloist or with a chamber music ensemble or a conductor and other times they really want to be left alone um, and bring something to you and then then they might solicit your feedback and they may or may not be interested in it but um, in the process of developing a performance especially a first performance uh, there's a really some of the greatest conversations I've had about music and about the cello have been with people who don't play the cello composers conductors pianists people like that um, but having done that so much in my life and knowing how some of my colleagues some of my students some of the people that I know in music maybe there's a little bit of um, fear sometimes or trepidation or even distaste at the idea of trying to take a piece that you can't hear that nobody's ever heard before a piece that's just been written or a piece that's just been discovered and try to find a way to um, make that into a performance that sounds um, like something you want people to hear from a piece of music um, very often in the new music world for those of you who participate in that um, and sadly for so many composers their new pieces are created. Uh, a composer might spend a year, many months, many years on a piece, and then um, a small group or an orchestra will get together for a couple of rehearsals, do their very best, play it once, and then the piece disappears. And one of the great joys of my life has been playing pieces, um, especially solo pieces, concertos, uh, sonatas, things like that, where I've actually li been able to live with them for some time and to you know, really practice them and really prepare them um, alongside with that that sometimes quick process where you're more or less sketching a piece and um, you know I know I've heard questions from my students questions from other people saying well you know look at this thing they'll show me a piece of music I don't even know where to start what what do I do with this it, what is it uh, how can I how can I even how can I even you know I'm afraid to practice it almost because I don't know how to begin and I think that's I think that's an interesting an interesting entry point into any piece, whether it's a, a brand new piece you've never seen before, or even a Beethoven sonata that maybe you could have heard hundreds of times or have heard hundreds of times. Uh, the idea when you first look at it, what do you do? And I think there are a lot of answers to that question. And it depends in part on what you're looking at. Um, There's so many different languages, especially right now in music. I think we're living in an age of, of real linguistic um, polyglotism, if that's a word, uh, real linguistic anything in any piece by any composer, you can hear folk music right alongside um, 12 tone music, right alongside uh, noise music, right alongside things that are drawn from jazz or popular musics of all kinds from all over the world. And, um, and composers have completely stopped apologizing or explaining why they might draw together every influence that occurs to their ear or their heart or their mind. Um, I was just working on a, a piece that, that um, my good friend Suli Antan wrote uh, for solo cello. And there was a concerto that she wrote also. And I remember we had done some other pieces together and we were talking about the development of the concerto. 
and she, and I said, well, you know, what do you think? What do you think it's going to be? How chromatic is it going to be? How how um, how she studied with Milton Babbitt? I said, are you drawing on you know Milton Babbitt? She said, well, of course, I'm always drawing on Milton Babbitt, but I'm thinking a lot about Schubert, and of course, I'm from Malaysia, so I'm 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 trying to bring together the sounds of the gamelan with Schubert songs that are that I'm obsessed about while remembering and using the techniques that Milton Babbitt taught me. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's this thing going to be? And she said, I don't apologize if it sounds like Strauss because I need a Straussian I need a Straussian climax of some kind, then it does. And if it sounds like Schubert because I need a song of a certain kind, then it does. And I found in the concerto there was moments that sounded like Ravel and lots of moments that sounded like um, gamelan music in um, different scale forms than we're used to and that sort of thing. And to get back to this original process, there were a lot of, in that piece in particular, I can say, there were a lot of composers, uh, I mean, a lot of meetings between me and, and Sue, where we would get into a room together and she would provoke me, play something that sounds like this, um, or she'd show me a fragment and say, hey, what do you think of this? Is this does this work on the cello? What does this sound like on the cello? And, um, and I would do my best to play it and if I did well, she'd be very happy. And if I did very badly, she'd furrow her brow a little bit and think, should she rewrite it, or should she just, or should she just trust me, or ask me to figure it out? And um, composers are constantly all over the spectrum on whether they want us to, um, whether they want us to struggle, and and find a way to something that is important to them artistically. Um, you know, as Beethoven famously did with the last movement of his violin concerto and some other pieces where he just said, I don't care if it's hard for you. You know, it's what it's what it needs to be. You have to figure it out. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But apocryphally, that's the kind of thing he might say. Um, and other composers who, if it doesn't sound great the first time, think about rewriting things. Um, and sometimes that's for better and sometimes it's for worse. And I have often had conversations with composers where I'll say, hey, wait a minute, I can't play this yet. But if you give me some time to practice it, I think I can make it sound good. Um, and, and, and I want that chance. I don't want to be, I don't want any of us to be sold short because we all know the history of music is full of pieces that seem too hard to some virtuoso, um, when the piece came out and then not long after one of that virtuoso students or, or somebody, somebody else came along and found the piece not too difficult at all. And, um, so I think it's important that composers write whenever possible that they write from their heart, and um, that we should do our very best to expand our technical languages, our expand our imagination, expand our um, especially imagination and our creativity, to be able to embrace whatever it is that a composer thinks they can dream up for us, and that's been a big part of my life and a thrilling part. And um, uh, starting from starting sometimes from just sketches, starting from hey, this is something I've been thinking about. And, and, and various composers have shown me little things along the way, little tidbits, just crumbs, sometimes just a motive. Hey, I think the piece is going to be about this. I carry around in my wallet a, um, a, little, piece of, um, a little piece of paper from Stephen Hartke that has a kind of, I think it's about a two-measure maximum gestural motive as he was working on, on, on a concerto for me. And, and I was... And he showed it to me, and and I felt like it was a, just a piece of um, a little a little nugget of gold. It's so special to have it, and I carried it around with me for a year while he was finishing the piece. And in the meantime, he brought me the first movement of the piece, and I searched and searched and searched, and that thing that was in my wallet wasn't anywhere to be found. Not in the orchestra. Not in anywhere. And and the second movement came along, and I the same thing happened. And I thought, I remember saying to Steve, wait, you gave me this thing. I thought it was going to be the core of the piece. And he said, I haven't figured out what to do with it yet. And it ended up in the, it ended up in the cadenza of the last movement. Um, and, and very powerfully so. But I, I, we joked about it. I said, well, he said, well, the piece just went another direction. Um, and so this idea that you, you get to be part of a composer's process sometimes has been an amazing, amazing part of my life. And I know so many of us have felt that... Um, I think the old adage, you know, hey, if we're not involved, if we're not involved in playing contemporary music, then uh, music history 
stops with our generation. And um, that's really, that's really scary. Oh, I'm so glad somebody's leapt in already. Gustavo Sanchez, hello. Thank you so much for writing in with a question. You're saving me from babbling too much here. Um, how does one first approach learning your 21st century work is the question. Do you go about learning the rhythms first and then the notes? Do you have a specific method or learning process? That's the right question. And, um, you know, that, that's one of the things I was saying earlier is it really does depend on the language of the composer. So, I mean, if you're looking at a work by, I don't know, a minimalist composer, the first thing you might do is um, obviously a minimalist composer might write very simple materials repeated for a long time, right? Uh, shifting slowly or changing gradually. Um, that my first, my first thing would be to make sure that I understood what the motive sounded like. I might play them a couple of times, but then I might spend some real time looking to see if I can discern any form, right? Because as you say, you know, do you go about learning the rhythms first and then the notes or the notes and the rhythms? That part of it's not hard in that language. If you're playing a piece that is very rhythmically complicated, um, a lot of the music of the 20th century or second half of the 20th century with um, complicated meter changes, um, heavy, heavy use of syncopation, irrational rhythms, um, things, you know, uh, mathematical rhythms like a group of 13 over three beats or something like that. Um, in that case, in that case, I would say your question, the answer to your question, Gustavo, is probably yes. And that's not really fair. But do you learn the rhythms first or do you learn the notes first? Uh, the answer is yes, one of those two. And it really depends, it really depends on the passage. Um, if, if you get too locked down into either rhythms or notes too soon, uh, that can be discouraging in a complicated piece. And I, that's why I say there's something about finding an overview. I mean, it'd be really great if the first thing we could do at a piece is sit with a score for a few minutes and say, oh wait, I think I see three large sections. I think I see some chunks here. And, and, and try to find out, for instance, um, in, a work, in a work by someone who writes in as complicated yet as clear a language as Elliot Carter, um, whose music I've played a lot, you might say, oh my goodness, there's, there are characters here. And you can see the characters. So you can see that there are characters that move very quickly, characters that move very lyrically. And I really look for, I really look for sort of a traditional, um, I look for traditional expressive content. And I try to relate what I'm seeing on the page and the first time I look at something to, um, I'm trying to relate it, I mean, for lack of a better word, a ba better reference, I'm trying to relate it to whether it's, is it Brahmsian lyricism? Is it Beethovenian motivic writing? Is it Bach? Is it baseline writing? Is it, um, is it the kind of music, can I discern from where this composer draws their influences? Because if they're like me, they've spent their lives listening to music. And you all out there, You've spent your life listening to music. You have music in your head. Um, we all have pieces that are very close to us and that matter to us. And pieces, songs, dances, um, all kinds of music. And some of that music will be drawn from, you know, kind of this, what we consider the straight line of canonical music history, but a lot of it won't be. Um, I was just at a hardware store today and I. I heard a song that I think was probably by Taylor Swift that I'd heard before. I don't really know a lot of Taylor Swift, but she's famous enough that the, that the little motives, the little hooks in her songs can get inside your ear. And if you're a composer, that stuff comes out. And um, particularly if you're a composer who loves Brahms and you write a contemporary piece, maybe the melody that you choose or the, um, the, the, the notes in the lyri lyrical passages are very loosely connected to somebody like Brahms, but if you feel the spirit of Brahms in a lyrical passage, that's an important association. Um, I listen very carefully and study very carefully when I'm practicing the way intervals react. Um, is it, are there small intervals or are there large intervals? Um, are those small intervals rising or falling? Um, and if I can identify some of those some of those natural shapes, the way that we always have, the way that Bach did, the way that Josquin did, the way that Monteverdi did, the way that Mozart does, um, whether the notes happen to be more or less dissonant, 
or more or less um, tonally based in a way where that I'm more comfortable with doesn't matter because I can draw on those associations. So I often find myself playing something absurdly complicated sounding, and somebody and I, and I think I'm playing I think I'm playing Ravel, and and somebody will listen to that and say I don't hear any Ravel in there, but I know that's what I'm hearing, and so those associations really matter. All right, I'm going to try to keep up a little bit with the questions. Here's a comment. Good evening, um, Miguel Angel Salazar, Angel Salazar. Good evening. Hello from Bolivia. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing your experience. Yes, I'm so glad you're here from Bolivia. That's amazing. Uh, here's Joanne Berg. As an adult amateur, do you have any suggestions for learning more about rhythmic and harmonic phrasing? I have trouble grasping these concepts when going through the box suites, for instance. Ah, right to the center of our, right to the center of our daily work. Um, yes, the box suites. The box suites are really tricky, and you're not alone. They're really tricky because, first of all, Bach was, um, there's an exercise that everybody who's ever been in, an, in a first or second year music theory class uh, has to do. And that's when you take a chorale melody <coughs> that was written by Bach, and you're given just the chorale melody, and you're told to use what you know about the rules of harmony to harmonize it. I hope some of you out there nodding your, you know, nodding your heads. You've done this, and um, so you go through and you look at you look at the notes and you try to say, hey, it looks to me like this is a melody in B flat major, and the first note is a D, which is part of a B flat major triad. I hope I'm not getting too technical. I don't think so. Um, so you start by harmonizing that D with a with a root position B flat major triad, and you work your way through the piece trying to follow the rules of harmony, follow the rules that we know, no parallel fifths, all that kind of stuff. And you, you can make something that sounds pretty good, but it might sound a little, in my case, they always sounded boring. My, my Bach chorales always sounded really boring, but they sounded okay usually. Um, and, then, and then your professor will say, okay, good, now let's listen to what Bach did with the chorale. And it's full of surprising chromaticism and different spellings and unexpected chords, chords that you would never have dreamed of, and, your, and his choice of which which notes in the chorale to make dissonant and which notes to make consonant are very complicated. So, Joanne, my, my, my anchor for you, I would say, um, you sp specifically asked about rhythmic and harmonic phrasing, and that's really the core of Bach. What I would suggest to you and all of you as you practice Bach, and I've said this to my students, and I really, I actually do this myself a lot, is I would practice counting. And when I say that, I mean counting actually out loud, saying the names of the beats. Um, because the most important thing about the suites, even, even probably the preludes in their own way, is that Bach wrote each of these pieces, especially the five dances, but even sometimes the preludes, he wrote them in dance meters. And what I mean by that is as simple as saying that all minuets are in 3-4, right? All bourrées are in 4-4 four, or 2-2. Two, two. Um, all gavats, all gavats have an accented second beat in a two half note measure. I hope this is again not too technical. All um, all courants are triple meter pieces, and triple meter is really different from duple meter, and particularly um, in the alamans. I find the alamans absolutely, absolutely wonderfully sort of confusing because all of the alamans are in 4-4 time I think some of them might be there might the fifth suite might be in 2-2 I can't remember but all of the alamans are in 4-4 time and there are rules about 4-4 right there's a strong downbeat a relatively strong third beat and and then lighter second and fourth beats if you play a Bach alamon while counting those beats out loud and trying to make your downbeats strong and your second and fourth beats less strong you'll find that an awful lot of the sequences, an awful lot of the phrase beginnings, um, awful lot of the phrase beginnings and sequences and everything come at sort of the wrong time. Um, and that's where your question becomes really interesting. Rhythmic phrasing or harmonic phrasing? Um, if you pay attention to what I'm saying as you're counting out loud in a Bach Allemande, you'll find that the harmonic phrasing makes perfect sense with the counting that you're doing, with the rules of counting, meaning the downbeats are on important harmonic mo moments, and the third beats are on relatively important ones, and two and four usually are on less important harmonic moments. But melodically, or sequentially, 
you'll very often hear really exciting events on Beats 2 and Beats 4. Um, you know, actually this is a place, William, I said I wasn't going to do a lot of illustrating, and I'm not sure that I, I'm not really warmed up or anything. But I wanted it, all of us know the G major Alamont, right? And, and the idea that if I, if I can do this without, you know, being too loud, and We haven't had a bass note in a long time, but that's the third beat. And then this place of rest, this cadence, that's the third beat. And this is the fourth beat. And here's one. So three bars in a row, we've had basses, um, what we would call sort of harmonic moments, moments of great sort of uh, weight or, or relative emphasis happening in the middle of the bar. And relatively speaking, he's put the downbeats, the downbeats in places that don't feel naturally strong. And what kind of dance is it that seems to come to rest all the time on the third beat? In any case, the Alamans are fancy and they're complicated that way, and it's really interesting to do what I just did. Count out loud and go, really? That's a third beat? Because I'll tell you, I played that Bach G major Alamon for many years before it ever occurred to me that that first open G string wasn't a downbeat. I didn't even think about it. And I bet I'm not alone in that way. Um, but then you look at, okay, now I've got it open. And it's just fun, because the courant is next. And we all know the courant starts on a... Um, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. So Bach is putting these sort of whether it's through his sense of humor, or his sense of playfulness, or his sense of musical propriety, he's putting all the bases on beat two. I don't know, Joanne, if that is a, is a helpful way in, but if you try to make the downbeats in the first suite courant sound heavier than the second beats, you'll learn something. You'll be onto something. And that something you'll be onto might be really playful and really fun. I don't know if that helps, but I hope so. I hope that, you know, I would encourage all of you, count out loud and try to follow the rules of meter in Bach. Try to follow, you know, in a 3-4 piece, one is strong and the other beats aren't supposed to be. And Bach loves to upend that. He loves to um, play with that. And, and in doing so, makes the phrases more interesting. Um, now, harmonic phrasing, the reason I brought up, you brought up harmonic phrasing and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk a little bit about it in Bach is because we don't have often enough information to know exactly what Bach would have done harmonically. We just don't. And so using guesses based on the meter, um, you know, ba based on where the downbeats are and assuming that most of the time on the downbeats, harmonies will change, you can really start to take your best guess. And if you do it a lot and you listen a lot and count along, I think you'll find that your guesses get more and more personal. And that's really all we want with Bach. We really want, we really want those suites to feel, to feel comfortable to us. We want them to feel like they make sense to us. And over time as you play them and get more confident in what you're hearing, you can say, oh, I think, oh, I think that was an E minor chord. You will notice in broad sense, in a broad sense going through, for instance, I'm looking just at the G major suite, but they're very, there will very, very often be almost the same harmonic processes in the second half of each of the dances. You'll almost always start on the dominant. You'll almost always spend a moment in the relative minor. You know, so you'll find, you'll have time in, in implied D major, you'll have time in E minor, you'll have time in those keys around there. And, and once you start seeing that the basic outline of the harmonies are pretty simple and pretty um, reliably similar, it may release you just a little bit from the feeling that you have to be particularly sophisticated about the harmonic phrasing and you count along and count in the meter and count the number of bars. And if you and if you can keep those two things in your head while you play, you realize, hey, you know, maybe maybe once in a while I get to play a four bar phrase. Particularly in something like uh, the bourrées of the C major suite or the or what or um you know some of the gigs, you might find your you if you count carefully, you can use a four bar phrase all the way through 
sometimes two four bar phrases linked together, sometimes a four bar phrase subdivided. And you'll feel all that stuff. Oh, I, it gives you confidence. Oh yeah, that was a four bar phrase. That's where I can take a little breath. And if I count again to four, oh, that's a four bar phrase. That's an interesting, that's a different kind of breath. Um, count and count in, I like to tell my students count in the dumbest way possible. Don't be fancy. If it's in 4-4, four, four, count to four and ask yourself, did that sound like a, an event of four beats that are supposed to be organized in a certain way? Um, you don't have to be a genius to do that. And I, and, and I think almost in a way it's better not to be. It's better to not get in your own way too much, but to just understand, hey, this is, these are the rules of meter. And when he upends them, any composer upends them, that's really powerful. Um, I want to get, let's see, let's, I'm going to try to go through this. I can see this conversation is going to be um, hard to keep up with. Um, Zhao Zi, hello, I was wondering if you have any tips on avoiding tension in the bow arm and shoulder. Oh my god, that's, that's definitely going to come up later on, and we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, thank you for that, for that Zhao Zi. I'll, I'll try to get to that in a minute. I want to read this next one for a second. Uh, here's Eric Frankel. Finding new repertoire is such a difficult task. How do you find the good ones? Do you have any advice for those of us who are new to this? Are there any composers in particular that you can recommend who's new to contemporary music? Oh, that's, you know, that is, that's a very good question. And, um, and I, I think there, I don't know, Eric, um, what level of, of performer you are or where, where you are in your process. And um, I must say, I leaned very heavily on my teachers for that. I, I had, um, I, I chose teachers I chose teachers and conductors and friends and other composers who, who, um, who knew a lot of new music themselves. And this feels, this might be a slightly unsatisfactory answer, but, but I asked, I asked questions. And, um, for instance, a lot of the new music I discovered happened, uh, when I was in high school, I had a friend who was a composer and he would, he and I would, would go to record stores together and he'd say, oh my God, so-and-so is so cool. And then I would buy a record by so-and-so and I'd go home and listen to it. And I didn't always agree with him, but that's how we did it. Um, we, we just, you know, it was a word of mouth and it was um, somebody else's enthusiasm often carried me into other places. So Eric, I would really ask, if I were you, I'd ask around. I mean, I brought up Suleyan Tan. I'm very happy to plug her music. Um, I, I, I love the concertos that she wrote for me. I love the solo piece that I've, that I've made a video of and and there's two beautiful song cycles that that I have recorded and, and enjoyed. I love the music of Elliot Carter. I, I love even the most some of the most sort of um, uh, thorny and complicated versions of his music. I find to be full of character and delight and charm. I also love the music of Morton Feldman. Um, Morton Feldman who who wrote very quiet, very long extended pieces and um, you know uh, then I'm also learning to love music of Hale Stork. And lately I've been playing a lot of the music of Jeffrey Mumford. Uh, these are some living African-American composers here. And um, so, you know, sometimes the first time I open a piece of music or listen to it, I might not like it right away. But if somebody that I trust has said, hey, this is great music, um, I'll, 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 I'll try to trust them and keep, keep, my, keep my head about me and work and work and work until, until I see my way in. The best stuff isn't always the stuff that sounds the best the first time you hear it. You know, that's not the most attractive right away. So Eric, I wish you luck, but I would say ask the people that you trust and like anything, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna go your first time to a Brazilian restaurant, go with a Brazilian who knows what to recommend. And all the worst thing that can happen is you taste something you don't like. But taste it. That's really what I would say. Um, and also you wanna follow a little bit your own way in. If you're new if you're if you're a cellist, Eric, and you're looking at um you know, there are some pieces that are good entry pieces into contemporary music that a lot of students appreciate. There's a piece, um, a solo sonata by Eric, uh, George Crumb from the 50s that's, that's, that has elements of Bella Bartok and some jazzy elements and things like that. That's a good way to come in. There's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful uh, set of, of miniatures by Hans Werner Henze, the German composer, who wrote, you know, pieces that might introduce you to 12-tone style without feeling without feeling um, overly complicated or anything. So um, I, I know a lot of people in this meeting right now have their favorite pieces and would love to put them in. So I don't know if you guys, anybody who's got some great ideas about their first contemporary piece that turned them on, send it in there. I mean, that'd be exciting. I love the Elliot Carty cello sonata and the two figments. I think they're great. 
Um, I can't believe what I'm seeing, but Vicky W. Hi, Derek. Just want to say hi. Let's see here. Suggestions on ways to inspire pre-college students to get into the works of living composers. I tend to introduce things I know and like, but I also want to encourage them to find pieces that they identify with on a personal level and are playable for a developing cellist. Vicky, I'm sure you've seen this. Vicky's amazing, great teacher out on the West Coast. Um, so thank you for checking in. Um, I'm sure you've seen this, but a lot of the younger people are more adventurous than we are. And they're on YouTube and they're on Spotify and, and the algorithms send all kinds of stuff. And I'm not sure we should be trusting algorithms all the time, but um, you know, if you, if you, I remember when this, when Pandora first came out, you guys might know what that is. And I made a radio station uh, based on the music of, of Weinberg, who I was just getting familiar with, who was Shostakovich's best friend. And it was really interesting what pa Pandora thought sounded like Weinberg. Uh, it wasn't always great, but it, but what what happens with the algorithms is they tend to move slowly towards popular music somehow or other and so you have to kind of stay on top of them but i think i think you young cellists who are listening now i mean who are in here now i think you're listening to each other play you're um there are lists in fact i know there's a list on the juilliard website for instance of what we think are interesting and important com compositions for cello by um by underrepresented composers I would suggest finding that list. I, I'm not sure I've, I mean, I helped make the list, but I haven't seen it. But there is a list. It might be in the audition page or something. Look around the Juilliard website. But a lot of schools have that. Um, there's a there's a man who works at Oberlin named, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's Chris's last name? Uh, Christopher Jenkins, who was part of publishing kind of a, a directory towards African-American composers and pieces they've written. Um, there are, we used to go to the information centers of various countries. I used to go to like the Norwegian Information Center or the Venezuelan Information Center through their consulates, and they would have somebody who worked in the consulate or in the, or in the, um, somebody who worked in a, in a particular um, sort of arts arts advocacy role for them in international, you know, through the through the embassies. They would have somebody who did that, and they might even have national publishing companies who would publish their best composers. Uh, it's gotten more democratized through the internet, but there is. It's the worst you can do, again, is is try something you don't like. And what would be so bad about that? Thanks, Vicky. I'll, I mean, I'll be glad to keep talking to you about this. But um, the best thing maybe you can do is keep doing what you're doing. Show them pieces that you know and like. But we've all been, at, you know, you keep listening, you hear all kinds of good things. Um, I heard several times this year for the first time, I heard Stolen by um, Loggins Hull, which is a beautiful piece. Um, and there are more like that coming out all the time. Um, Okay, next up, uh, YouTube audience. Hello, I was wondering if you had any tips on how to get fast and high shifts in tune other than playing them really slowly. Playing them slowly doesn't always seem to work for me. All right, so um, I wanted to, all right, we're gonna talk a little bit about, we're gonna talk a little bit then about some technique. There are two technical questions that have come up. One is how to reduce tension in the upper arm, I think. What was it from, uh, let me go up a little bit in the chat. From Jazzy, okay. Uh, avoiding tension in the bow arm and shoulder. All right. Um, it's a huge topic for all of us, um, but I would say the whole. You know how they joke about how the um, the leg bones connected to the backbone, the backbones connected to the. You know, there's a song about that. Your finger bones, if to use that analogy, are connected to your wrist bones, your arm bones, and the shoulder bones. It's, in other words the simpler jiao that you can be in the feeling of, as it were, one thing. Your arm to your hand being one simple thing. And it, that, starts, that starts in a way with a simple unencumbered bow hold, which I'm sure you already have, but you might continue to refine, we all do. And, and trusting that through that bow hold, in one, one simple approach the arm sits on the string and so if you want to talk about how to reduce tension in your shoulder and neck I think where that for most of us where that comes from or where it's probably most where it comes to you the most would be when you're reaching for the end of the bow on the D and especially the A string right when you're when you're feeling your way around the cello like this 
and 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 in order to do that you might find yourself rotating your shoulder and elbow up and maybe even dropping your wrist and sort of trying to create leverage this way and that can put a lot of a lot of tension right here so if you're holding your cello now and want to even any of you who want to do this um, I would say maybe take the bow with both hands and put it down at the tip tip of the D string for instance and just just feel the lightest possible balance you can out here and just sort of check what your shoulder and arm are doing. If it stays simple all the way down and your access to the to the tip of the bow is is sort of unrestrained. I even sometimes tell my students, hey, put your hand down on your leg, hold the bow with the wrong hand, and just reach out as simply as you can, like like that's your pencil and you're picking up your pencil to write. And if you'll find that if you do that, your bow hold tends to be very naturally slightly pronated. Your the line from shoulder or neck and shoulder to hand is pretty simple and you don't do anything too fancy. But then if you were to play a down bow, you might find along the way that you do do something kind of fancy. You drop your wrist, crank up your shoulder, do all kinds of things. And I would just say, try it again. Put it down here and pull the bow to the tip. And if this arrival feels a little high in the shoulder, relax it, drop it, check it again. Remember this feeling and try it again. And you want to end up in the same place that you were at when you did this. So you can sort of become your own teacher. Find, find a, a direct and simple way to get to the tip and then practice getting there without getting in your own way. Um, I do find one of the problems for many of us is trying to figure out what and how much flexion and activity we do with our wrist. And all, there are a lot of great cellists with a lot of different opinions about this. And um, mine is, my opinion is, is that the wrist stays, it's best when the wrist is pretty simple. You know, the, the direction to the wrist, I don't like it when my wrist gets way too low. I don't like it when my wrist gets way too high. Um, I like it when the wrist is pretty neutral. After all, I don't know how many bones there are in here, how many nerves, how many tendons, how many things are going through that passage. But if you can keep it pretty simple and quiet and let your fingers be a little fancy and let the weight come from your upper arm, I think in the end that's going to help this whole idea of letting your arm down. Um, one other thing to try, Jiao, is to place the bow in the first six inches, first six inches out to the balance point and just feel your arm and shoulder when it's really heavy. You know, just like that. And and gradually taking sorry, I know I'm a little too yeah. Okay. Gradually taking that feeling further out of the bow. And seeing how little you can change as you get out to the tip. Try not to have this motion be too different from this motion. After all, anything we can do, anything that we can do to simplify the physical approach to the instrument is probably better than anything we can do to make it more complicated. You know? If that makes any sense. Um, I hope that's helpful. Now, somebody asked about shifting, which I'm really interested these days. Um, so shifting, shifting high and trying to be in tune. I think it's... All shifts, uh, let me see here. I think all shifts have a couple of elements, and it's important to, to be able to break it down a little bit and figure out what's in your way. All right? So let's say you're trying to find this famous high D that we all have to find so many times. Okay? One of the first things that I'll do, and a lot, I'll do this quite a lot, and, I'll, and my students maybe, I drive them crazy sometimes, but I'll say, hey, if you know you're going to play a down bow D, you know, that pitch in this with your third finger, practice that place first. Practice, and not just the place, practice the, the balance of your arm, the, the balance of your fingertip, the kind, the speed and intensity of vibrato you want, the contact of the bow, whether you want something that's attacked or something that's sort of, or something even maybe without vibrato and you know, different different ways, but you, the sound that you want in that place, practice it. Because the whole goal of a shift, of course, is simply to play the note. The shift happens before the note. It's not part of the note. And I think that's a, 
that's kind of a powerful memory to say, hey, wait a minute, this note, I can play this note. And if you can play that note, you can play it whether your hand starts on top of your head or whether your hand starts down here. Or, you know what I mean? The, the, the shift is something that happens before you play a pitch. And that shift may be part of a minor six. It may be part of, you know, a half step. Right? So that matters, okay? But the important thing is that the arrival place you practice, okay? Then the next thing about it is you can analyze a little bit, um, if you want to break it down technically, you can analyze the shift in terms of what is actually happening. There are several things that are happening in shift. First of all, are you changing the bow? Is it this kind of shift? Or is it, right? If you're not changing the bow, then you've eliminated one of the things you have to think about. If you are changing the bow, then you have to decide, or, or explore at least, which bow do you shift on? Do you shift on the new bow, in which case you're starting from down here? Or do you shift on the old bow? Which sounds something like this. Right? And or some combination, you know? And I find a lot of times we practice we practice one kind of shift, but then when we're listening with our our full kind of musical engagement in our hearts and minds, we do something we never practiced. And if you never like if you if you spend all your time practicing a very careful sort of old bow shift, I call it. Shift. Like that, you practice over and over again, shifting on my second finger, and landing like that. And then I get into the passage and I go, oh. with a new bow, I have never practiced that feeling, and I'll miss the shift. Um, so, knowing which bow you would like to shift on, and maybe practicing both, being fluent in both kind, both bows, is really helpful. The other thing I would say, and maybe the one that gets under thought about, is, is usually in a shift there's also a finger change right you might be shifting from your first finger to your third finger or from your third finger to your first finger right and i've been my students who are here tonight will, will sort of chuckle i've been spending a lot of time if i'm doing a shift like say from f sharp to g here third finger f sharp to first finger g which would come up in all of our scale work right something like that right um I, 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 even as many years as I've been doing this and everything, I still find it helps me to practice going from my third finger to my first finger in one position. So I'm feeling my third finger change to my first finger. I know this is super basic, but it helps so much. So you go back, and then once I know what this first finger wants to feel like, I have a connection between the fingers that's independent of the shift. Is that is that confusing? I don't. I hope not. So you can practice. You can practice the the other thing that happens in that shift I just described is that I go from a, a hand position where I'm playing two half steps E F sharp and E F and F sharp to a hand position where I'm playing two whole steps. So I can sometimes practice just that. So there's the two half steps, and then I can practice changing my hand shape and do that independently of the shift. So there are other things involved in shifts that are not just about moving the location. And if you practice those other things, the change of the bow, the change of the finger, and the change of the hand shape, then sometimes the fact that you're changing the location is really not a big deal. It's not so hard to change the location of your hand. It's, it's these other things that get in the way. So try to, try to be a little more patient and creative about what's involved in the shift. And you might find that the real problem was actually changing your balance from your first finger to your third finger. Or changing, you know, a lot of times shifting to your thumb is really hard. I'm, my, my old teacher, uh, Joel Krosnick, used to laugh at me sometimes because I would do... I would shift to my thumb. He'd say, why, why do you do that? And I, I said, well, you know, when I, I got used to kind of thinking that way with all the proper etudes I practiced for a little while. And all, you know... And I, I, I found I was more comfortable. He said, don't do that. Go to, you know, go to your first finger and extend. But I was super uncomfortable with extensions. And I would shift to my thumb. But doing that is interesting because when you do have to shift your thumb, which we all do sometimes, the problem usually is not so much the distance that you move your hand. It's the fact that having your thumb up is such a different way to have your arm associated with the cello. So if you're going from, say, an F up to an A like this, 
you might find the real problem is getting the thumb up and around the neck and your arm, this arm, where it's supposed to be. So I practice them. I'll practice just getting my thumb up. And then, does that make sense? So you practice preparing the hand for, for this part of the playing rather than having it down in these positions. I hope, um, I don't remember who asked that question about shifting now, but I hope that helps to kind of maybe break a log jam. Maybe there's some, maybe it's really a change in the way you imagine how you practice the shifting, you know, that, that's more important. So start with the sound, the color, the emotional content of a high note by itself. Figure out what you want. Get used to it. Find the balance. Find the feeling. Get it comfortable in your arm. You can do all that. You do all that independently. And then analyze what you're actually doing, if that makes sense. Analyze what you're actually doing and float up there and do it a couple of times. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Um, oh, you said fast and high shifts. I'll just say no shift is as fast as you think it is. Um, sl you said playing slowly doesn't seem to always work for me. I, I understand that. Um, but the, the slowness of the shift is just giving you a chance to hear it. So remember, if you're, if, you're not, if you're not listening with either the end of your old bow or the beginning of your new bow, lightly, listening with a very slow, relaxed bow while you shift, then of course slowing them down won't help. You'll just get tight and it won't make any difference. But the shift should always be as slow as, not, not as slow as possible, but you should practice it slower probably than you think you need to in the rhythm of the piece. Um, Cindy Zeiher, or Zeller, uh, Zaher calling from New Zealand. Wonderful. Oh, I hope your weather is nice down there. It's terrible here in Cleveland. I was wondering if you had any experience playing symphonic slash sonic poems. Do you have any particular approach or sensibilities you would like to share? Um, yes, of course I played symphonic poems. I, I assume what you're talking about is works like um, the, the famous symphonic poems of Strauss or the nationalists, the romantic nationalists. And, um, and um, yeah, I mean... Each of those pieces, one of the great things about a symphonic or sonic poem form is that, is that very often those pieces, the musical structure does not follow typical sonata form patterns or typical rondo patterns or that kind of thing. And, and it's the goal of those pieces, I think, is to try and illustrate musically something literary, right? An event or a, an event or an a literary idea. And a composer's imagination goes on fire when they try to do that, you know. So um, the famous Don Quixote um, of Strauss, where you know you're supposed to sound like you're battling a windmill or you know anything like that. It's a uh, you know the the idea that a composer's imagination is unleashed in a poetic way is fun. So what I would say is, is try to try to understand if you can read the poem and and find out if the poem has any direct content. Sort of what we call um what they call programmatic music. Does it actually follow a story? That might give you a hint into the kind of music that's there. But a lot of that music's hard to play. You just have to practice, you know. Um, uh, sure, Vicky. Ariana Nelson, you're kidding me. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ariana. That's great. <laughs> it's really nice that you're here. She says she uses the, uh, the, shifting, the shifting technique that we talked about back at Juilliard a long time ago. Um, yeah. Let's see here. So are there any other... Any other questions? I know at some point I'm supposed to answer some practice room questions that I that I saw and then promptly lost. Um, oh, here's a new one. Let me get down there. Um, Ariana, I hope you're doing really well, and Vicky too. It'd be great to see you guys again soon. Uh, question for in the practice room segment below. What is on your music stand right now? Okay. Well, you just saw that I had no trouble accessing um, accessing the the Blue Baron Rider edition of the Box Suites. Um, I also have, I share this, I gotta say, I share this music stand sometimes with my daughter who is learning to play the cello and getting more serious as a high schooler. And, and so one of the things that's been showing up on our communal music stand is some of the, some of the really, um, really fundamental. And I smile now because I skipped all this stuff when I was younger and I, I hope you guys didn't and don't, but I skipped things like, um, look at this, this is. 21 exercises by Dupour. I mean, I had never even really seen these that I remembered anyways. And so I went back through them. And the first one is, you know, it's really dumb, but it's, it's half position and it's half position with no extensions, basically a bunch of double stops and, you know, forming the hand. And I gotta say, as I get older, it's terrible, but I, I find I really enjoy Grützmacher 
Dupour, even Dotsauer and Lee, some of these very simple things, uh, Kosman, all these, all this stuff that I felt tortured by when I was younger. Now I'm finding it really, um, really helpful in terms of building shapes with the left hand and uh, staying in shape and keeping myself limber. It's like um, joint hygiene for my hands and and the constant battle against uh, the constant battle against imprecise intonation and everything, which I find these exercises really, really do help. Uh, the simplest exercises are the ones, I mean, the best exercises for me are the ones that only take a few minutes to play, but really, um, really tune up my hand, you know? Um, so that's, the, but, but really what's on my music stand is my iPad. And right now I'm getting ready in two weeks for those of you who are in New York, I can plug something. I'm going to be playing a recital at the Musicians Club, which will have um, two solo works by Jeffrey Mumford, um, the Lankawi Mythology solo piece by Sulian Tan. It's sponsored by the Edvard Grieg Society of New York, so where I'm going to play the Grieg Society with the, the Grieg Sonata with the amazing pianist Roberto Plano. And um, he's going to play a Grieg Nocturne, and we're going to play a couple of pieces by the Ukrainian romantic uh, Lysenko, who is a composer I've just uncovered with my, along with my, um, my association with, um, my association with the Ukrainian Institute of America, which is, um, which, which is a mansion on, on the Upper East Side on Fifth Avenue um, in New York City, where, where they, the, the purpose of the building is to, is to preserve and protect and promote Ukrainian culture and art. And um, uh, long before this terrible war that's going on now, um, I got sort of associated through this, there's a great violinist, uh, Solomia Ivakiv, who, who runs that, who runs a, a very good concert series at the Institute. And she, little by little, started throwing Ukrainian pieces at me. And there are some wonderful Ukrainian composers. And Lysenko was, um, you know, was kind of amazing because he, he, uh, he wrote an opera that Tchaikovsky loved. And Tchaikovsky said, we'd like to do your opera in Moscow. And, and Lysenko said, well, that would be fantastic. They started talking about it, and, and, and Tchaikovsky said, of course, you know, we can't do it in Ukrainian, we'll do it in Russian. So, you know, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, but it's a Ukrainian opera, and, and the performance never happened. He, he would, he, rather than have his piece played in Russian, he, he um, chose not to have it performed, a big opera, which must have been an enormous sacrifice. And um, so, uh, one of the things that was, I've been preparing this recital program um, is thinking about how music is of a place, and composers are of a place. Composers write from where they are in their time, and um, that's a, been a valuable way to look at even music that we think of, we're, we're taught in history classes and theory classes as absolute music, the music of Brahms and Beethoven music, but you look at it actually, no, that music was from a place too. It was from their place, and, um, and that's fantastic. So that's what I've been working on right now, and then after that, we're doing a program uh, I'm getting ready for a program of all women composers that we're going to play at the United Nations in March during Women's International Women's Month. Uh, some chamber music that I haven't heard, so I'm excited about that too. Um, here's an interesting question. What's the first thing you do on the cello every day? You know, I'm not as routine with the cello as I am with other things. Um, my first drink of water, my first toothbrush, that kind of thing. But um, it's rotating for me. Right now, I have been actually, just for the last week or so, these do poor exercises I just showed you. I've been picking one of those to practice for the first thing each day because I find that um, there's a simplicity to them, and I and I have it. I'm always looking for things that will help my students and that will, as it were, tune up my hand. Um, so I play more more securely in the double stopping, reminding myself how far apart the half steps are on the instrument. Um, I'll try to do a little bit of that, but very often, depending on how busy I am and what's going on, the first thing I'll do it'll be slow and it'll be light. But I may need desperately to play through, um, to play through some of the music in my in my recital that's coming up, or in a concerto that I've got, you know, coming up. Um, I've got the Elliot Carter Sonata coming up soon, and I might sit down and very lightly and a little under tempo just say, "Hey, first thing, just you know, warm up, play a scale for ten minutes, and then I'm off." Yes, okay. The first thing I play a scale for ten minutes, but then it's into maybe some exercises if I have time and then right into repertoire. And I use a lot of my repertoire practice is a lot like my scale practice. If I know there's a passage, for instance, there's a passage in the Mumford solo piece that I'm playing, two passages that are, that are just real finger twisters, very fast, very dissonant, all over the cello. And I can use that as a slow warm up the way one might use um, 
some of you might be playing fancy things like tenths and octaves and you know in scale form I might go into Mumford and, and work my hand up that way but I do it lightly and slowly kind of in the in the mode of scale practice if that makes sense um, here's a question why do you practice what drives and motivates you anything that helped during the pandemic uh, boy that's an easy one I practice because I feel terrible when I'm not practicing I practice because I miss it I miss the sound of the cello I miss the feel of the strings under my hand I miss um, more than anything I miss sort of the place that my the place that my mind and my um, I don't know I don't want to say soul I have never put it this way but the place where my kind of mentality my existence goes when I'm able to take the time and and be be present listening listening to music listening to sound listening to my body um, paying attention I find that um, maybe it's a kind of meditation it's almost the opposite of meditation because it's so the focus is so intense but I find that to be powerful and and when I don't do it when I don't do it I feel bad if that makes sense um, but but also I have to say what drives and motivates me not always but very often what drives and motivates me is there are deadlines you know there are concerts to play there is stuff that has to get done and um, when I'm driven by those external motivators uh, sometimes I, re I resent practicing I resent making the time I resent the time away from my family I resent that I can't cook a better dinner I resent that um, that it means I have to say no to a student who wants some extra help or whatever I don't like making those sacrifices but um, the flip side of it is if I don't have if there's not a concert coming up in the next couple of weeks and I have a little bit of what I call fallow time then I love to just sit and, and practice new stuff like the, these old etudes or or looking through a contemporary score that has been sitting on my pile for a while that I haven't gotten to and just that pure exploration for me is um, is necessary and it's a joy uh, I hope you all feel that way too at least some of the time what helped during the pandemic was that I had piles and piles of music that I'd never really learned the Rager solo sonatas uh, the Weinberg solo sonatas the um, there were so many projects that I've been waiting for I've got a Lindbergh concerto in my basement that I haven't gotten to yet you know that I've been meaning to for years um, and then even standard pieces I mean all of us have all of us have Beethoven sonatas we played more than others all of us have box suites that we played more than others all of us have um, maybe one of the Mendelssohn sonatas we know really well and one of them we don't um, so the pandemic was for me a great gift I got to do all that kind of stuff and um, and I got to that was also the same time we were really through the George Floyd protests and everything we were really being everybody was being very proactive about trying to learn music from other places music from people that had not been represented and that was a huge a huge um, sort of wellspring of of really exciting music I must say during the audition season this year in the last couple of years I've heard a bunch of bunch of you probably out there playing pieces by people that we wouldn't have heard a few years ago and I think it's fantastic um, let's see here what do you enjoy the most about practicing I think I sort of just covered that what is your favorite way to change things up or get new ideas uh, how do you go about deepening your musical imagination oh my god you guys have good questions um, my musical imagination is deepened by listening to the what's going on in my hands um, I was talking with a student the other day and I was reminding them hey um, a major sixth is a wide interval that rises uh, if it's going up of course and what does that feel like what does it feel like to lift a major sixth listen listen to it um, what does it feel like to lift a minor second to lift from the second to third finger that distance and the impl the implied chromaticism the implied harmonic harmonic relationship of that leaning up a half step is really different from the implied rise of a minor sixth or you know if you're dealing with some you know more modern music or other music it might be a minor six plus an octave or two you know what does that feel like emotionally and I find every day just listening to intervals listening to shapes to rhythmic gestures as I practice I mean it's it's endlessly it's endlessly um, inspiring there's just nothing uh, nothing about it is ever boring to me so um, but I do also get an awful lot of new ideas from my friends and my colleagues other cellists sometimes but composers conductors violinists pianists anybody that I play with the members of my trio who always think about things in different ways than I do um, listen to your colleagues listen to how they practice listen to how they what they're interested in um, the best thing about being a chamber musician might be that 
you learn how learn how to, the best things from two or three or four other people. You learn what they do best, and you get good at it too. I love that. Um, in my mind, what is it that makes an effective practice session? Good question. Um, that's if I sit down consciously, sort of knowing what I want to accomplish, and and I make some steps towards that accomplishment. That feels really good to me. Um, I think all of us have the, the sometimes we'll sit down pick up the instrument not knowing quite what we're going to do and if we're lucky something good happens but often not we just tire ourselves out playing through something we already can play or whatever um, I really am a believer especially for those of you who are learning you know trying to learn pieces for competitions or auditions or your own recitals your own projects um, sometimes it's useful to decide what you'd like to try to learn before you sit down and um, and then even brainstorm a kind of way of getting that thing learned uh, how much repetition you might need, what kind of repetition. Um, there's a very often, you know, that third page of a concerto or, or that or that last, that that um, second third of a big Bach prelude where you just sort of get lost and the beginning is starting to sound pretty good and the end feels pretty good, but there's this thing in the middle and you just don't know what it, just don't know what's there. And sometimes it's really good, I find it's really productive to say, hey, I'm not going to practice the beginning or the end. I'm really going to sit down and figure out what is it? What's what's this thing made of? How is it related to the other music? Practice the development, you know. Practice the coda. Practice the places that aren't just the main thematic statements. And sometimes targeting that is a really good, really good practice session for me. Um, particular practice method that you swear by that has remained of consistent value for you over the years. A go-to strategy. Yeah, slow. You got to practice slowly. It took me forever to believe that. Um, I remember when a, a friend of mine in high school was listening to, to me practice and. She came into my practice room and said, Derek, don't you ever practice slowly? And I said, of course I practice slowly. It was very defensive. But the truth is, no, I didn't. I ran through things at tempo all the time. And, um, but just slowing down, um, I like to think that I practice best when I'm practicing what I call in slow motion, where I'm trying to, trying to really imagine exactly what it is that I'm going to be doing, not just slowing down the tempo and definitely not playing stop, start, stop, start, but always trying to, sort of connect things in, um, in what I imagine. Uh, the analogy I use is that if you want to learn to run a 100 meter dash, you wouldn't get very far by starting out walking. You know, it's, the motion of running isn't the same as the motion of walking. Um, and so you have, to, you have to practice slow running if you want to get better at that. Uh, so slow motion practice would be that. What are the best ways to prevent injury? Slow motion practice. And, and in general, asking yourself, if there's any way you can be lighter during more of your practice time, can you be more resting, more rela more, um, you know, not, don't push the strings down any further than to the fingerboard. Once they're down, they're down. You know, um, there's no sense in pressing with your hand on the cello string. At a certain point, the sound is made by moving the string side to side. Yeah, a certain amount of weight has to rest there, but you don't need to push on it. It doesn't help. You're just squishing the string then. Uh, so best ways to prevent injuries are to stay light. Also, as I get older, my body's not as, uh, my body's not quite as, um, uh, I don't know, what is it, well lubricated as it was when I was younger. And I find that I have to do more outside of the cello um, exercise. I have to do more yoga and um, uh, Alexander technique and um, uh, um, Feldenkrais, things that I've learned along the way. I have to make sure my body's warm and moving. I, I you know, self massages, all kinds of things that, that, that thus those of us who are getting older do to keep our hands and, and arms from not getting too tired. Um, here's another one. How do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? With such a big workload, how do you avoid burnout and maintain balance? Um, that's a great question. I don't think I always do it well. I, I don't tend to get burned out, but I do lose balance. Um, I do, and I certainly get exhausted, and I certainly end up um, making sacrifices that sometimes I wish I didn't have to. Um, and, and I don't know, as a professional musician, I haven't met any of my colleagues that feel they get balance right all the time. But I have learned, I have learned in the last decade or 15 years or something that, that saying no is powerful and saying no is, is, um, is, is um, hugely important. You have to know your limits. You have to know when the choices you make are going to um, send you over a cliff. And that doesn't prevent me sometimes from doing too much. You, those of you who know me know that, I, that I'm too busy most of the time. But um, 
I have learned how to say how to how to say no to certain things, and <clears throat> and I don't think I've ever really regretted it. Um, and I want you, you know, when I was younger, though, my advice for young people is say yes, say yes all the time. And um, yeah, sometimes you'll be too busy, but that you never know when when something that something that you didn't think you really wanted to do, you didn't know anything about, will turn out to be the most interesting and inspiring and life-changing event in your musical life. Say yes if you can. I really believe in that. Um, how has my practicing evolved over the years or recently? Is there anything that surprised you? Um, yeah, it's surprising to me how dumb I remain. It's surprising to me how ineffective so much of my work seems sometimes. and and how every time I think carefully about it, there's there are new ways to do things. It surprises me that stuff that I thought I knew in my 20s is, um, I hear myself, I know that it was right, and I know that it worked. There's evidence. I hear the recordings. They were, you know, I know that the stuff I was thinking about in my 20s was working. And I hear myself saying stuff that sounds kind of opposite of that, and it's helping also. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to play the cello. Um, and getting too stuck getting too dogmatic about the way you play or the way you move your hands, um, that's, that's, that's a bad idea. You have to stay nimble and you have to listen. I listen to my colleagues all the time and I'm constantly, constantly um, uh, motivated by somebody saying something that I think, I think is probably, I used to think was wrong. And then I practice it and I go, oh my God, they were right. That's really good. Um, Evan is here. How you doing, Evan Khan? Good to see you. Uh, one of the greatest things, oh no, that I took away from my lessons was how to approach older music and new music with the same sense of wonder and possibility. There's time, can you speak to that? Well, Evan, that's, thank you for that. That's very, very simple. Um, I started to talk about that a little bit at the beginning. Um, I look for Brahms in new music, or I look for Bach in new music. I look for associations. When I'm playing new music, I'm looking for how that composer is rooted. What's their history? What are the, I'm trying to hear what they're listening to in their head whether it's a connection to their own earlier music or maybe to a music from a teacher that they had or or um, any number of influences. I remember playing um, I remember playing a piece by Philip Cashin that he wrote for me a long time ago. And, you know, we were talking about the piece and talking about music and, and every, you know, we were talking, his, one of his great teachers was Oliver Nussen and, um, and, you know, there was stuff that sounded like Ollie and we would point that out. And then he would say, oh, but Derek, listen to this, what's that? And he would sort of quiz me. And I'd say, what, is that another, is that Ollie Nussen? Is, it, is that Simon Bainbridge? He said, no, it's Peter Gabriel. And I don't know if any of you know who that is, but, you know, from the rock band Genesis. This is one of the most sort of edgy and interesting and wonderful composers who's now the head of composition at the Royal Conservatory in, in London. But um, this is, he was not writing simple music, but he thought he was writing Peter Gabriel. So I'm always looking for that, Evan. And I'm looking in old music, I'm imagining... Um, how at that moment in time that piece that that composer was writing was the newest piece of music in the world it was brand new and you know I mean I, I we joke some I joke sometimes to my students when you're going through a Haydn quartet and they say well there's only a couple of F's and a couple of P's and I say yeah but that was radical Bach didn't write any F's and P's a lot of the time there were no fortes or pianos you were supposed to you were supposed to you know understand that and and musicians did that and Putting yourself in the context of the of the music that's there makes it come alive for me, and and the early music movement is particularly thrilling at sort of unleashing themselves from a sense of tradition by going deeper into the tradition. You know, you hear um, early music people come in and they'll add percussion to pieces that we thought were string orchestra pieces, or they'll you know add add all kinds of. I mean, it's amazing what they're doing, and that level of creativity, that level of engagement with the music, as though you have a right to, you have a right to trust your own understanding of the language and go with it. I mean, that's been very liberating. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think that makes the end of the questions. If you give any closing remarks, that would be great, and I'll let you know once the live broadcast has stopped. Um, well, I hope that this was, um, I hope this was, I don't know, um, some food for thought for those of you who came. And thanks so much for those of you who I know who came and for those of you from all over the world. Um, I, I just want to say that, I just want to say that practicing music is, I mean, what a gift, right? What a, what a way to lead our lives. I mean, could we, how could anybody 
imagine spending your time in any better way than than sitting with Bach or Beethoven or or I don't know Jeffrey Mumford, Elliot Carter, um, Sulian Tan, whoever, whatever is as we talk about what's on my stand. I mean, trying to live in a world where people are are trying to be expressive through sound. Um, I hope that on the, on the days when you're discouraged, in the days as I get, in the days when you're tired, in the days when it feels like it might be about um, getting something or achieving something, that you remember that the that what you want to achieve is is the opportunity to continue spending your time with with music, and I I treasure that more and more as I'm as I get older and as I do this more. Um, what a what a gift we have to to have access to these instruments and these bows and 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 these notes to play. Um, some of us are even writing our own notes. What a what a um, wonderful way to live our lives. There are a lot of wonderful things you can do with your life. You could be an accountant. You could be a house painter. You could do a race car driver, and a lot of them are thrilling. Um, I don't see any better than what we do. So I think, um, and not only that, cellists are such nice people. You know, we really get along. Um, we really like talking to each other about this. So I guess, as a closing remark, say thanks to the Cello Bello for being out there and doing what you do, and all of you for showing up and, and um, asking these provocative questions. I really enjoyed it. William, do you have anything you want to say, or, or what do we do now? Uh, no, that is all. Yeah, we'll 